I always love coming back to New York. I'm originally from Brooklyn. Uh, now I'm living in Austin, Texas. I gotta tell you, I'm not used, to, there's a reason why I left. And it's days like this where I've been enjoying 80 degree weather and uh, get to come back into the 50s. So you may be wondering why I have no shoe, I'm coming up in crutches. Um, actually, if we put up the presentation, um, we'll get to kind of like the Tootsie Roll mystery. Um, if you ever wondered who would win in a battle of tug of war between a 50 pound pup and a 200 pound man, I've got the answer for you. This is my puppy Hero. Uh, now he's a little over a year old, but when we adopted him about four, uh, when he was four and a half months from, from the rescue, uh, he's a Border Collie Lab mix. And uh, on Friday night, we went out for a walk with my son, and I, we almost never go together, but he decided he wanted to start playing while we were in the park. And I'm holding the leash, and he starts going after my son. My ankle stayed in one place, but the rest of my body decided to go with the dog. Anyway, so I'm gonna try to stand as long as I can. This is here for just in case I can't keep standing, but we'll go from there. When I adopted Hero, what's the first thing you do after you adopt a dog? Where do you take him? You take him to the vet. So I, I get to the vet and they check him out. Um, he had all kinds of problems because they found him in the middle of, the, of a field. Big mess, you know, things in his ears and yeah, anyway. Cleaned them all up, got them all set. But while we were at the vet, the vet handed him what I call now doggy crack, okay? If any of you have a dog, uh, you should know that Greenies, or if you've never used them, Greenies pill pockets are like the most addictive thing for this. I mean, he'll do anything for you at any time, just give him a little piece. And so of course, while she's handing them out, I want to figure out, can I get them? So what do I do? Grab my phone, go onto the Amazon app, find it there, and I order it. I get home a little later on, what does Amazon start offering me? Dog food. Makes total sense, right? If I'm looking for dog treats, maybe I might need some dog food. So of course, now both of these are on subscribe and save, and I get them every month. And just like that, Amazon has added $1,000 a year of extra expense, right, that they're taking right in my wallet. Cool. Now, doesn't take a big data scientist to realize that if you're um, buying dog snacks and dog food, what else are you gonna need? Come on, I didn't have to say it, did I? <laughs> So for $9, I got 1,000 bags <laughs> that I'm still going through. Um, and I was holding one when all of this happened. But just like that, seamlessly, they've now taken this one event of getting a puppy and just, here, give me more money, give me more money, give me more money. How many of you would like to be like Amazon where you can get your customers just to give you money just like that? That's what this is about. So we'll, we'll be giving copies of Be Like Amazon out to, I moved it over there, see? <laughs> to everybody later on. By the way, so it's coming out in hardcover next month. We printed these just for you guys. They'll, you'll, they'll never appear in paperback ever again, but you have the first copies of them. So let's talk about Amazon. This is the, um, actually my brother's Amazon homepage. You wouldn't want to see mine. But anyway, think about this, this site. Is it that different than your homepage? Is it that different than any of the top B2B and B2C homepages? Right, they all kind of look the same, very graphic, white backgrounds, nothing, nothing so spectacularly different. Then why is it that 43% of all US e-commerce went through Amazon this past year? Why is it? I've been involved in the industry since the mid to early 90s. I started my first uh, conversion rate optimization with my brother in 1998. Okay, so we were thinking about this a long time ago. We've been telling people, hey, we've got to focus on optimization. We've got to focus on customer experience. You know, this is all before the top bomb days. And we've got to focus on analytics. I was the founder of the Digital Analytics Association. And it sort of like, it, it progressed, but it went pretty slow. And now all of a sudden, Amazon's gaining more and more and more speed. And so I want to kind of, dissect it for you today so you understand what it is that made them so successful. And it's not what you think it is. And when you see it all kind of break apart like this, you're gonna be like, oh, if Amazon can do it and a lemonade stand can do it, then we can do it. So let's think about this. 43% of e-commerce, the average 
conversion rate for the top 500 uh, merchants is around 3.32%, right? If you get to the top 10%, you're at 11.5%. But Amazon Prime members, how many of you are Amazon Prime members? Just curious. Okay, um, I just saw the figure the other day. It's now 63% of US households. <laughs> Mind boggling, okay? 63% of US households are Prime members. Prime members convert at 74%. If you get onto the Amazon website, three out of four times, you're converting. So what makes Amazon's site 22 times better than yours? Can anyone give me a logical reason why it's 22 times better? Huh? Just shipping? Anybody can ship, anybody can do supply chain. Personalization. Personalization. Customer behavior, piece of it. Data, easy to pay. Data, easy to pay. Assortment. Assortment. There is all, there isn't all of the above. Well, let's 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 dissect it. Okay. Um, obviously, that prime membership is growing. The numbers now they're talking about 80 to 85 million uh, people. They spend three to five times more. But I'm going to give it to you at what Jeff Bezos believed from day one, and I think this is what makes them so different than every other company out there. If you've read the Brad Stone's the Everything Store, 1994 already, 95, he was already thinking this way. He said, the most important single thing is to focus obsessively on the customer. Our goal is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. Let's think about those words, customer-centric company. How many of you believe that your companies are customer-centric? Raise your hand, just want to see. I mean, most of us would agree that, or at least trying to be. How many people have ever met Jeff Bezos or heard him speak? Do you think this is a warm, fuzzy guy? <laughs> no. So what does he mean when we talk about customer-centric? It's not like they have you know, customer service people calling you all the time. They're not done heavily on social media being out there. What, is it, what did he mean? We heard a little bit today. What Jeff Bezos understood from day one that the internet gave him that no other medium ever gave him beforehand was that he could tie everything to a unique identifier of a single customer, back then their email, then cookies, now their mobile phones, tie them all together and know every site you visit, because I've got millions of affiliates, every product you browse, everything you share, how much you read, what you watch on Prime TV, what you tell Alexa, nobody have it in the room, good. All of that data informed them about the customer behavior and they could leverage that to keep generating more and more income. And yes, they were given a lot of money to bet on this on the long term, but were they right? It was a leap of faith that both him and the investors made that if we focus on doing the right thing and aligning ourselves and creating a better customer experience for the, for the customer, we'll gain over the long term. In fact, when you start looking at some of the all the benchmarks of brands, Amazon now is consistently voted among one of the top corporate reputations. And this chart here on the bottom, this is the one that is going to be most important to, for all of us today, is the fact that this is a score, this 8.38 that they score is number two, between what customers perceive of their brands and what they say of their brands and how well they align. Because everybody would like to say they're customer centric. And in fact, in a Bain study, 80% of executives when asked said, yes, our organizations are customer centric. But when the Bain executives asked those same exact customers of those companies, only 8% of those customers believe that those organizations were customer centric. Just ask the United CEO, he'll tell you. And if you don't believe him, he'll really tell you. Being customer centric is actually pretty hard. And it's not just one piece, it's, not, it's, it's a key piece of this, but you actually have to do this based on the, this four pillar concept. And we're gonna talk about it in a lot of detail. And if you're wondering um, where I got this, first of all, I never worked for Amazon. I've had lots of friends who've worked for there. I've gathered lots of data, lots of stories from, from them and other people. But one of the first articles I ever wrote about the four pillars of Amazon is actually shared by Amazon recruiters to their potential candidates. Okay, and you can see among their highest things that they share. So obviously, it's definitely something about them. But what makes this work is that these four pillars are part of a flywheel. 
okay? And this is not Amazon's flywheel, this is customized. This is a flywheel that all of you can kind of create together. If we can get every gear working correctly, this works. The first one and the first focus is on customer centricity. That's gonna lead us to a culture of innovation, that's gonna lead us to um, um, uh, a corporate agility and then continuous optimization and that cycles around. Now, before I go on, I wanna really illustrate what I mean by customer obsession. So I actually need two of you to come up here. Can I, can I, ask, um, can I ask you to come up and, and you to come up? We're gonna put you guys to a challenge. You, you up for a challenge this morning? If you can just step up. You, you can put the glasses in, you're gonna need your hands. Okay. Yeah. So I, the inside these boxes are exact same product, okay? One of them from Amazon, which you get. Thank you. And this one from another retail. I'm not gonna tell you who it is because we don't wanna shame them or anything. <laughs> okay, now, this is one thing that's, I've only heard Jeff Bezos talk about. It. Nobody else has talked about it, and I don't understand why. And so when I, get, when I tell you to get started, you're both gonna try to open this box, and then you get to keep whatever, whatever's inside, too. Okay, so you ready? Uh -huh. Ready? Are we ready? Uh -huh. Let's watch them. This is kind of like, a, you might remember this one. Don't worry if he gets the early lead. I feel pressure. Just, Hold on, he's still got to get it open and start oh. using it. Oh, start using it. Oh yeah, it doesn't end. It doesn't end when you just open up the box or get it delivered. It keeps going. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Should we start getting them out for him? You've got the nice nails. That's the that's the challenge. If you didn't have the nice nails, she would have been in there right away. Totally. See, so he got it. He got he got it in quickly. Oh, no. Okay. But otherwise, sorry. I sabotaged, sabotaged it with the nails. <laughs> this was actually a pretty easy one to open for, as far as most of them. To win. It wasn't bad. <laughs> but how many of you have had clamshells like Larry's had that are virtually impossible to open? Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> We've all experienced this, haven't we? But Amazon's the only one where you can actually order frustration-free packaging from. Think about that. Why is that? <laughs> now, all of you could be frustration-free, honestly. What does it take to deliver something that just feels better than anyone else. I have a friend of mine. He lives in Tampa, uh, Florida, and he wanted to open up a donut factory, okay? Anybody can make donuts. But he said, how am I gonna make myself different? He said, well, first he was gonna start with the mini donuts. But the most important thing he said to, to his whole staff is, no donut goes out unless it's ready to be photographed on Instagram, Yelp, Google, Facebook. They all have to be absolutely gorgeous. And if they don't look right, they get tossed, okay? So how many of you delivering products, okay, delivering your packages, letting people walk out of their stores with that kind of impression that they just want to photograph it? How many of you? I'm going to show you an example of one later. Actually, funny enough, one of my friends shared on her Instagram this morning um, the same product, essentially, that my daughter had. Completely different experience. And it happens. Little things make the difference in being outstanding. It's an obsession over customers. And we can look at some of the brands and this obsession that Amazon has had and the way they've leveraged their uh, flywheel has let them gain so much market cap versus all these other retailers, right? It's just said over the last few years, they basically replaced the revenue of Target and, and Sears and JCPenney all in one. And it's because when you focus in on customer experience, right? Even um, uh, uh, Mattermark, who did this research based on Forrester's uh, customer experience index in over a six year study, found that those who invested most in customer experience had almost a 70% difference in market cap to those who were the laggards, okay? There's a lot of opportunity to invest in your customer experience. And no matter what category you're in, for every single point, and this is according to Forrester, that you invest in, in retail, Right? It's worth several million dollars. I think, on, where was it on retail here? 
Um, Fifteen million dollar. Uh, wait, hold. Where was it? Uh, big box retailers. Two dollars and forty-four cents for every single point that you do. Okay. So huge opportunities if you just focus in on having a better experience than most. Now, some of you are saying, okay, well, you know, building a great experience is a lot of work. I got to tell you, it's sort of like, well, I probably would have a challenge with it now. If I took a stick and I put it on the ground and I'd ask you to hop over it, that's the bar for most of us today. Okay? Unfortunately, Amazon is definitely setting the bar a lot higher. But we can work to differentiate ourselves from everyone else and then keep climbing. To understand how Amazon got here, we've got to go back a little bit in history. If we start in 1995, and that was the original Amazon homepage, they were selling books, right? And they were targeting borders and Barnes and Nobles. Now, the, the crazy thing is today, Amazon does, spends more in R&D than Barnes and Nobles does in revenue. Okay? But it makes you think, what was it that was so different about Amazon back then that made them so successful compared to everyone else? What did they do differently back then? Yeah, they focused in a lot of the long-term options where you, if you walked into the bookstore, if you were lucky in a mega store here in Manhattan, you might have had 100,000 titles, okay? They focused on all the long tail, so that's where they started, okay? But then obviously, they kept growing, and they did a number of things to their site, uh, and we'll talk about some of those things, that let them grow over the years. Then, of course, they added music next. And of course, between Apple and everyone else, they killed Tower Records. And of course, my friend worked at, at both Borders and Tower Records, my friend Kevin Urtel. He's got a good track record going. <laughs> Don't worry, now he's at Nike, so I think it's safe. And then they went ahead and they said, we're going to add more categories, and we're going to keep with Walmart. So we mentioned before that data was at the heart of their success. But what's the difference in data between Walmart, who is the king of data and has been for years and years before them, who has retail stores within 91% of Americans are within 15 miles of a Walmart store, and Amazon? What's the difference? No. Nope. Known customers. What do you mean by that? Right. So when I walk into a Walmart store, or she walks into a Walmart store, she may be Walmart's most valuable customer, and I may have never stepped in beforehand. They have no idea. They know everything down to the location, to the product, to the SKU, but not down to the customer. You have to understand your customer behavior. That's what Amazon, that's why Amazon has killed almost all the retailers. Basically, that's why they've been able to grow so much fa faster than Walmart, because they knew there, there's going to be one low-cost provider. They are going to be the king. We got that. How do I know that? You just have to look at the growth charts when both of them hit approximately 60 billion, and here's Walmart when they hit 60 billion and where they went afterwards. And then you start projecting them out. The blue one now is Amazon. The or orange one was Walmart's growth. Which one would you have rather invested in? Amazon's growing faster, and it's growing earlier than Walmart ever did. And it's because of all the scale that they can do with the technology down to the customer that they couldn't do beforehand, OK? But let's look at why Walmart didn't become the success that they should have. And it comes back to what I told you earlier. What did Jeff Bezos believe? We could be Earth's most customer-centric company. What did Sam Walton believe? Well, these were Sam Walton's 10 commandments. This is what he believed. How many? People, how many people, I don't know if anybody here works at Walmart, I apologize in advance, okay? But if you look at these 10 things, how many of them can you recognize that they still believe today? Let's start with number two, and I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Sam Walton would have never have let Walmart have the welfare market that they kind of do today. Would have never have happened. And when you fail to follow those beliefs and it turns into your actions get broken, it's obviously you don't care about your customers. You don't care about exceeding your customers' expectations. And it got broken. This is the challenge. And so what Jeff Bezos did is said, look, you know what? We're going to focus on this, but we're going to do this over the long term. We can't focus on quarterly profits. It's not going to work. You have to believe that this is going to take some time. What we're going to do today is going to take several years to see investments with. Okay? And they've convinced investors to do that. Now, when I started putting this content together, I started thinking originally about, you know, it would be great if we could copy Apple. But not everybody has a Steve Jobs in their back office. But really what 
Jeff Bezos has done is nothing amazing. Honestly, it's not. There's one kind of new revolutionary thing he did, but it's, again, nothing brand new, but how he put it all together. Jeff Bezos went around when he started raising money for Amazon, it took him 60 meetings to raise a million dollars. Back when everyone was throwing money for, for business plans. Okay? So again, if he can do it, anybody else here can. I'm gonna give you another example of a very sexy business that leverages the four pillars. Uh, if you live in Tampa, Florida, um, or if you've ever been in Florida, you know they have a problem with bugs. Big bugs. Big flying bugs. They're not very pleasant. And we have some of those in Texas too. They're not, not, not a whole bunch of joy. But my friend who's the CEO of Safer Home Services has grown to be one of um, uh, that area's fastest growing um, pest control companies by leveraging these same exact four pillars I'm gonna to talk to you about. They do once a year pest control. They send a technician in once, they close up everything and they make sure nothing ever gets into your house so you never have a problem. And you can see, by now, actually these reviews now are over uh, for like 4.93 since I've taken this screenshot. So let me ask you a question. If donut factories, the mini donut factory in Tampa and safer home services in Tampa, people who squash bugs for a living, can leverage the four pillars, how many of you think you might be able to find somewhere between that and Amazon? <laughs> yeah, okay. So we'll start with a couple of questions for you. What are you doing to understand your customer? First question. And getting under more understanding of their behavior. What are you doing to collect more data? And what are you, deliver, what are you doing to always deliver a five-star experience, even opening up the package and using it. You gotta think that way. I love this. How many of you see that, uh, have seen that this past week Amazon released this uh, Echo Look, this little camera that's gonna sit there and take pictures of people so they can get fashion tips and all that? This is a lot like the original Amazon uh, Echo, right? That didn't have a lot of functionality, but what is it, what is it there for? It's gonna let people take pictures of themselves, and, but what is it really for? Gather data and let their artificial intelligence, which he told you about in his shareholder letter that they're gonna spend a lot of money on, use that data to train with the fashion people so that they now can custom print clothing. Crazy. Two, continuous optimization. This is where I spent a lot of my years focusing on conversion optimization, just helping people realize that. And I, I sort of left the focus of only letting companies do conversion optimization because I realized without leveraging all four pillars, you can't actually be successful in conversion optimization. You can get a little, you know, little bump, but you can't get the full organizational impact that someone like Amazon has. You know, the product page above the fold at Amazon, you can't make changes on there without permission from Jeff Bezos. He cares that much. But he also understands investments in things like the Kiva robots are a conversion issue, are an optimization issue. How can I get products to you more accurately, faster? How many of you live in a, in a prime now city? How many of you are amazed when that package gets to you with like in a half an hour or an hour or two hours? These two packages ordered the within minutes of each other. One came within two days, one came 10 days later. One, with shipping and everything cost me twice as much as the other. Anybody want to take a guess which one it was? And I'm not naming retailers. But Amazon started their testing on the web early. That was one of the key things that they did. And that was one of the first recognizable things they did. In fact, you know, when they did tests, they just did big ideas. Not little iterations of everything, not the big multivariate test. Hey, does the in-stock messaging and pricing stand out better than the old version? And if it did, great, let's move on with it. In fact, at that time, and by 2004, my friend Ronnie Kahavi did a presentation at eMetrics and he shared that Amazon was doing over 200 tests a month. In Jeff Bezos' shareholder letter to a couple of years ago, he shared how they did over 1,900 tests last year. Right? How many of your CEOs know how many tests you guys have run? Big tests. Even when they do little tests, this is a picture of their add to cart button over the years. Okay, I've collected them that one's for like from 1997 uh, and we go on. It's not just variations for the sake of variations. Each time they made a change is because they were trying to bring more value to the customer and also a change in their business model. So in the first one, they added the one click. In the next one, now you're selling used items, right? They wanted to give you more inventory to choose from. By the third one, you know, they started, have, they started promoting A9. Okay, that may have not been a big value one, but 
they like to fail. It's okay. They learn. They got rid of that. Now you had more things. And so every single time, it's about how do you create value. It's not just testing colors and shapes and buttons for the sake of it. It's how do I add value to the customer experience. Back in 2004, and this is a slide from Ronnie's presentation, even then they were using data to drive the full experience. There was no discussions about what was on the home page. Everybody in every group had a slot, and basically the data was what decided what to do. I'm going to show you some of the other cool things they were doing in 2004 in a couple of minutes. But I want to show you another example of just s simple innovation, right, and optimization of, of the processes that allow you to grow incredibly. You're going to meet Dewey Jenkins here in the blue shirt. Dewey is a HVAC contractor from, um, I think, South, North Carolina. Last year, he was invited to lead the Labor Day Parade. He is the town celebrity because of all his commercials. Okay, But even this commercial will give you a sense of how great their innovations are and why they're growing so fast. And by the way, they've added a Prime membership now as well for their customers. Kind of cool. You definitely would want to look them up. We talk about them in the book. People should never have to be uncomfortable in their own home. Truck 17, this is Bobby. Call Morris Jenkins. We're here till midnight, and we've got the answer. You'll have warm heat at your house tonight. Just by extending their hours, and if you're one of their prime members, whenever you call you have a problem, you get rushed to the top of the list. That's it. And people pay for the privilege of being rushed to the top of the list makes total sense. How many of you could get customers to pay so that they can come to the store and never wait online? Never have to wait for a fitting room? To have exclusive hours beforehand or afterwards? Right? We just have to start thinking differently on how we can improve and add value to our customers' experience. The other thing that they do very interesting is how they look at analytics. Okay. Jeff Bezos talks about the inputs, because if you look at only outcomes, you don't understand what happens. You have to look at what makes up those outcomes. And so one of the things that Jeff Bezos does and all his product managers do is they don't necessarily focus on the short-term sales and results. They focus on key things that matter to the brand. And what does that mean? They matter to you. So what are the, when you think about brand Amazon, what do you think about? Price, right? A huge selection, never going to have a hassle. Right? How fast it gets to you. Well, guess what their product managers are responsible for? One, selection. They need to have seven times the category depth of any of their top five competitors. Price. They need to be between 5 to 13% lower than their top five competitors. And this is why they built that algorithm that changes it millions of times a day. And they'll always be over 6 million times a day product prices are changed. Availability. They turn their inventory of those millions of products 20 times a year. Walmart, around seven times a year. Tiffany's around, uh, I think it's around 30-something. Apple, Apple's extreme, 74 times a year on those high-margin products. We should all be so lucky. And then lastly, from a customer experience point of view, they have ranked 13% higher on the American Customer Satisfaction Index year after year after year after year. So. How are you measuring success? Are you aligning with what your customers see, the, your customer reality data? Not what just you believe in your internal business data, but how do you know in the long term whether you're aligning with their goals? How often are you experimenting? Okay? And is everyone responsible in coming up with ideas to improve the company from boardroom to stockroom? Because they're all responsible for delivering the experience. Culture of innovation. As I mentioned earlier, Amazon spent over $15 billion in research and development. I think um, uh, Barnes & Noble's last year did a little over $6 billion in revenue, just to put that in perspective. They're spending more money in research and development for the long term. Because a lot of people say, well, you don't have to be, you know, of course Amazon's doing because they don't have to be profitable. In fact, Amazon has over $8 billion in free cash flow and $15 that they invest. That's $23 billion that they could be investing into profits, but they know they've got to do this long term, right? And these are some of the things that they've been invest in, um, uh, innovating on for years and years and years and investing in. So here's an example. 
From 2004, they had an internal program that picked the links, generated the keywords, wrote the ads, determined the, land, uh, the landing pages, and managed the bids by conversion rate, profit per visitor, and updates the bid on real time. In 2004, how many of you today don't have a program to write your ads still? Right, maybe you have bid management, but they were writing ads and picking the landing pages by machine 13 years ago. What do you think they're doing now with their AI? They experiment and innovate with things like adding pro services to things. So if you were going to look for like a uh, Nest uh, thermostat or this Sensei Wi-Fi thermostat, now with one click, you can go ahead and include installation. If you buy a, a faucet from them, you can have a plumber come install it for you. Right? They're always trying to say, how can I improve the experience? Right? One more piece, and with one click, I could just add it on. But they've been innovating since the very early days, and it's the reason they're, one of the main reasons they're so dominant. Right? It's the reviews. How many of you check a review on Amazon before you buy anything? Right? Almost 50% of Americans are doing that at this point. But when you think about it, Amazon had a really hard time fighting with the publishers to get the reviews on. Okay? They didn't want to let reviews of the books going. And Jeff Bezos said, no, you don't understand. We are not in the business of selling books. We're in the business of helping customers buy books. That's a customer-centric model. And so their community has rewarded them by writing uh, reviews written as stories, as romance novels. He always brought home mil on Friday. After a long, hard week full of days, he would burst through the door, his fatigue hidden behind a smile. There was an icy jug of Tuscan whole milk, one gallon, 128 fluid ounces in his right hand. With his left hand, he would grip my waist. I was always cooking dinner and pressed the cold frostiness of the jug against my arm as he kissed my cheek. I would jump, mostly to gratify him after a time and smiling lovingly at him. He was a good man, a wonderful husband, always brought the milk on Friday, Tuscan whole milk, one gallon, 128 fluid ounces. And it goes on and on. By the way, 2,216 of 2,261 people found that useful. <laughs> and Amazon doesn't even sell the milk. This one, though, is my favorite. It's called Serious Problem. This product copiously leaks out of my nose whenever I read these reviews. <laughs> you should go ahead and you can read more of them. They're, they're really great. But another example of a great innovator. How many of us have ever been into a jewelry store? What does the typical jewelry store look like? You walk in there, security guard by the front, you got some salespeople in the back, you've got all the glass cases, everything's hidden behind there, you got a point and look it out. So what did Spence start doing? No glass cases, everything open. All they sell is engagement rings. You can go in there and you can try on every single engagement ring in the world. They started up in Toronto. You, you think, okay, well there's mil millions of dollars of engagement rings, people can just walk out with them. Well, no, all of them were made with cubic zirconias for the models there, but then they built them for you. But they keep innovating. Um, they've just now innovated with their digital displays and some of the things they're doing with there. They innovate in the way they optimize their cash flow. Again, we talk about that a little more in the book. But this is a company that's been growing incredibly, okay, compared to other jewelers just because they rethought what the customer experience should be like. Get rid of the displays. Who would have thought? Now certainly, for two decades I've been telling people online, you gotta act a lot more like Amazon. Because if you wanna win, you gotta do what they're doing. They didn't do it. Guess what? What's Amazon about to do now? They've opened up how many? Five stores. They've reinvented the store. No prices. You walk in there with your phone, you can scan the price personalized to you. Change the way the books look, everything is facing out. You don't know, you have to design you know, books to, for that people can see it on this title. You have to, that's why you have to stand out in yellow and stuff like that. You have to think about these things in other bookstores, but Amazon will never work that way, right? And they keep innovating around brick and mortar retail when a lot of other companies just haven't invested in, in doing things like this. Let me ask you a question. Why didn't board, uh, Borders or Barnes and Nobles think of doing something like this over the last 20 years? because they're busy chasing them instead of being, how do I stay ahead of my customers? Here's one of my favorites. What's the biggest pet peeve in every single store? People hate what? Checking out. They hate going, go, finding associates who don't know anything about their products. Happens all the time. And so what did Amazon do? How many of you remember uh, Amazon Go, the video that came out? 
share ten, tens of millions of times. When did they release it? Does anyone remember when they released it, by the way? Two weeks after Black Friday, when the pain of waiting on lines was fresh in everyone's mind. If you haven't seen the video, again, it's not perfect, people have told me. But why hasn't any other Walmarts and all the other companies have been able to do something even similar? so you never have to wait in line. No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. <laughs> so how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. So I also want to put the, put the uh, irony of the timing on this, okay? What patent ends this year for Amazon? One-click patent ends this year. They offer to license it to everybody. Guess what they're going to be offering to license to all the other brick-and-mortar retailers now? They'll be all part of Amazon Cloud Services. You know they also started a call center service now, too, right? This is the kind of innovation that we need to retailers to do, and there's a lot more opportunities still to innovate. It's not done, but that's what we have to start doing. What are we doing to stay ahead of our customers, okay? Amazon doesn't know the business you're in. They'll try to figure it out, I promise you. But you have the opportunity to be a lot more like them, and then it becomes a lot harder for them to take over that industry, at least not without acquiring you, which they've done in diapers and a couple of others, right? Zappos. Where is your innovation happening in the organization? Corporate agility. Jack Welch used to say, an organization's ability to learn and translate that learning into action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. And this is what Jeff Bezos understood. There are no silos at Amazon. Everything is built in small, functional teams. Why is Amazon called Earth's oldest startup? Because everyone lives as an independent startup. They have people there on the business side, on the merchandising side, on the product side, and they're all self-directed with their own goals, with their own metrics, and their own decision-making and experimentation to do things. By the way, Ronnie Kahavi is the, uh, now he works at Microsoft, is that guy in the uh, front to your right, okay? You have to be able to execute on ideas. It's great to have innovation, but if you don't execute on it, it doesn't get you anywhere. And if that innovation isn't customer-centric, it's not gonna solve the problems long-term. Is everyone getting this? This is why this all works together. You have to be agile, you need to execute. And so one of the things that kills execution is the fact that we live in these silos, data silos, communication silos. And so this is an example from another very sexy company. I know a lot of you are gonna have a hard time struggling with this one. They're a junk removal company. He literally started the company with a pickup truck that said, got junk. So this is part of the O2E brands, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, uh, and every morning they meet together for their huddles. It's 10.55, you had your morning coffee, then you get ready to have the biggest meeting of the day. Welcome to the huddle, everybody. Uh, let's start with some uh, good news out there. Who's got some good news? Huddle's important to us. It's like a family dinner where the entire team or family gets together every single day to check in and say, 
How's everything going? And how can we as a team help support each other? No memos, fewer emails, people talking face to face and truly connecting with one another over what really matters in our business for that day. It's a super quick way to figure out what's going right, which team is being successful in what ways. It gets me out of my desk for a few minutes out of every day and hear everybody's good news. All right, let's take a look at the uh, numbers for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Let's start with online visitors, please. Yeah, Australia is up 38%. My favorite part of a puddle is absolutely the numbers. Well, nothing is a secret here, including how the companies are doing. And jobs completed. It's a great opportunity to motivate and jazz people up to. Crushy! <laughs> Just seeing people beat goals is really, really exciting for me. Okay, so in the news today, we have PR. Vanessa! In the news is fantastic. People talk for just a short time about what's important to their departments. It gives us an opportunity to learn what the other departments are up to and find out if there's any way we can help them with that. So, any missing systems out there? Any missing systems? Missing systems and opportunity is my favorite part about Huddle. By being able to raise your hand and put it out to the floor something that's not working is a great opportunity for us to solve it right then. We actually have franchise partners joining either in person or with video, and those missing systems really help drive our business forward. Now let's go to Toronto. Uh, welcome to Vancouver and Toronto for jumping up on the phones and helping out the phone. My favorite part of Huddle is definitely to cheer because we take everything that we've learned, all the good news we've heard, and we distill it down into one simple sentence that we can come together, cheer together, and leave inspired. Together. Just the right cheer can set me off to have an amazing day. It's the moment we sort of all wait for to see what's the host going to pick. It's a big moment for them. The musical ones are probably my favorite ones. One, two, three. Don't stop. <laughs> What a perfect way, no matter what's going on in business, to start with good news and end with a cheer. People come into Huddle excited every day to find out what's new, and they come out invigorated knowing what the rest of the day, rest of the week looks like. It seems to really refresh the day and make me excited to get back to work. Take a moment to all come together, celebrate being the great culture and community that we are, and focus all of our attention on us as a community as a whole. We wouldn't be half of who we are today if it wasn't for Huddle. We pulse faster, we grow faster by coming together each and every day to understand where we are and where we're going. you got to come and try it. How does that seem to be believed? Right. Could you imagine not having any of your internal emails all day long, how much time you'd save just on that alone? Right. Uh, by the way, if you're up in Vancouver, they invite people to come uh, to ch check out one of their huddles. They're, they're very open about it. Um, and it got started by picking up junk. Now they do uh, 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 detailing of your house. They can paint your house in one day. They can move you in one day. No hassles. And it's all about the customer experience. It's, you point and it's gone. Um, great story about what these guys are doing. So how quickly do you respond to companies? How quickly can you change? How well do your teams work together? Right? You heard there, they're looking for the missing systems. What needs to constantly be optimized? How, can, how they work together to do that? Now, what stands in the way of the four pillars in most organizations? It's actually pretty simple. Instead of being customer-centric, they're focused on the organization and management and where people are in the hierarchy. Um, instead of continuous optimization, there are people there who like their fiefdoms. They want to maintain the status quo. They don't, they're not trying to be innovative. It's like, hey, we've got systems. We're going to run things the way we run them and not going to change anything. Uh, we're competitor focused. You've got to stop paying attention to your competitors. Your competitors today are coming from every single nook and cranny out there. You just never know where they're going to come from. So focus on satisfying your customers and staying ahead of them, you'll be much better. And then from a corporate agility, it's just misplaced accountability. Right? If you spend a lot of time arguing about attribution, you know you've got a problem. That's your first diagnosis. But probably the biggest innovation that Jeff Bezos brought to this, because the four pillars are nothing new. In fact, if you want to grade your company on the four pillars, you can go to the Be Like Amazon website, and there's a little quiz on there, and you could share with other people, customers and, and suppliers. And you can get, this is a methodology that's been out there for 13 years that's been doing this. GE, healthcare, and a whole bunch of others have done it. The way he's managed this, the way it makes it work, is in meetings, first, there's a chair that represents the customer. But secondly, there's no PowerPoints. Everything is written out in a short narrative brief, a five to six page document that explains everything. You want to come out with a new product, you've got to write the press release first for how the customer would feel about it before even a line of code goes into it. 
So it's always about writing in these clear and concise senses, these narratives, because the narratives, the stories, are what translate from one person to the next person. Think about it. What famous brands you know has taken back snow tires when they only sell fashion? Nordstrom. That's a great legend, right? Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. But that story tells their, all their associates, right, from boardroom to stockroom, that what do we do? We take back everything, so no questions asked, right? That is what the success of all brands do today. They're customer centric. They leverage data all over the place, and their customer behavior, and they're managed by narrative. So let's finalize this. What makes this all finally work? And it's where I started. What did Jeff Bezos believe? Right? We've all been listening to Simon Sinek, and he, everyone wants to talk about the why. But if you actually listen to his presentation, his TED Talk, he actually says the word believe 17 times. Why, he only says once. It's what he believes. What did Jeff Bezos believe? He wanted to be what? Earth's most customer-centric company. That's what he believed. And so I want to give you an example of we believe, because now I'm starting to see these in all these stores all over the place. We believe. We believe. This one comes from Lush. My daughter went to a new Lush store that opened up in Austin near the domain just a few weeks ago. And she walked in and she grabbed a mask. And her and her friend went and they started driving home. And she decided that she wanted to open up. And she's bought from Lush plenty of times. She's a huge fan, 15-year-old, can, can only imagine. And so my friend who posted on Instagram posted a picture from Lush. Now, the difference is, when she posted it, all of this cream, and it's a little hard to see on the screen, was all nice and smooth and packed in there really nicely. But when my daughter was about three minutes from the house, she decided to open it because she wanted to smell how amazing it was because she loves the smell of these facial masks. And you can't kind of see it, but you see this dark space in here? It looks like fingers were in it. So she calls them up, and she speaks to herself and says, oh, no problem, of course. Customer's always right, right? Right before the green. Bring it back. We'll exchange it. And she walks into the store, finally, to drive all the way back. And she says, OK, I brought this because I opened it up, and this is what it looks like. And the associate there said, well, that's the way it is. We can't return it. What do you think she felt about the brand? So here's the challenge that most organizations have. It's not that they're going to meet your best employee on their best day. They're going to meet your average employee on their average day. And so the person she got on the phone probably believed all that. But obviously, the person she met in the store may have been the person who packed it. Didn't believe it. Okay, And it eroded the relationship with the brand. Will she keep going back? Yeah. If they mess up again? You think she'd come back another time? No. And especially because she's just a 15-year-old girl. She can go. This is the challenge. This happens in every one of our stores, in every one of our businesses every single day. So you create buyer legends. So these stories can be told. And I'm not going to go into details on the process. So I've written a whole book on it. But basically, you start from the customer's point of view. You outline what the experience is going backwards, starting from what a five-star review is actually going to look like. And then talk about it detail by detail by detail. And then tell the story going forward. And then you execute on it. And then you do it again. And you start with a simple campaign. And then you go on. And your whole business gets to these narratives that everyone starts sharing. This is what we found for companies like Google and all kinds of brands that we work with. This is the recipe that works. And so I want to share one last thing for you. I, th I think hopefully today I've shown you that any brand can leverage these four pillars. Retail is not dead. We love to shop. How many of you love to shop? Come on, admit it. We all love things. But the way we want to buy things is drastically changing. So I live up in North Austin, and my friend Rich Last, some of you may know Rich, he's been around the industry for a very long time. This past weekend, he was up in Waco. Do you know what Waco is famous for? Well, well you know, everyone knows what it used to be famous for, right? <laughs> what is Waco famous for today? And Chip and Joanne. How many of you have been to the store? Just curious. Only one of you. OK. Is it a destination? OK. It's amazing. They have food trucks out there, games for the kids to play on the, on the lawn, uh, all kinds of products. Now she's going into skincare. What? That's what retail is supposed to be like. It's not about just distributing products. 
It's about creating amazing experiences, memorable experiences tied to these products that customers love you for, that they believe in what you stand for and to be different. If you just want to be like every other store and just have racks and racks of clothes just showing up on there, yeah, you're dead. But if you truly want to be innovative and be like Amazon, even a lemonade stand can do it. Thank you very much.